Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar and the federal government disagree over the debt profile of Nigeria. And finally, Governor Godwin Obaseki makes its predicted move to PDP as the party delays its primaries. This is Plus Politics. I am Kayode Ladendi. Former Vice President Atiku Abubakar has again criticized President Muhammadu Buhari's administration for the nation's debt stock, saying the future looks bleak for the country and its citizens. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohamed, disagrees with the former presidential candidate's statement, saying it is anchored on a false premise, saying one who must criticize the government must do so based on fact. Wading into the matter tonight is Pastor Wale Adifarasi, the senior pastor guiding Light Assembly. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. And also we have uh, Chief Loretta Aniolago, who also will be doing justice to this topic. This man, oh, this woman and this man will be joining us on our Zoom platform. You're welcome once again. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, let's start with uh, your reaction. What, in your opinion, is the substance in Atiku's criticism? Let me start with Pastor Wale. Well, first of all, um, even developed countries uh, during COVID-19 have had a, a major challenges with uh, de their debt profile. Um, I was just watching on, on Sky News this afternoon that, that Britain had a 200% debt to GDP ratio. Um, now, so I'm not surprised that Nigeria's debt profile has risen over COVID. The problem in Nigeria is that we had already had a high debt profile even before COVID-19. We were spending way too much um, on on um, paying way too much of our revenue on paying for debt. And I, I would say it is because, and, 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 and I would level this criticism also at the, the, the government uh, in which the former vice president served. We are spending far too much on, on, um, on things that aren't important. The presidential system is already a very expensive system. And then officials travel. Um, sometimes one wonders the rationale behind their journeys. They're collecting funds. And, and so we're very wasteful. So in that, I agree. And, and I don't think that um, it is fair for the Minister of Information to have said that he should bring evidence. It is clear to all that we are a wasteful uh, a country. We spend far more than we need to on, on, on running government. Okay, let me take that same question to Chief Loretta. Against that backdrop, that uh, when you look at the revenue and what you are doing on debt servicing, that seems to be the point that uh, former Vice President raised. Um, yes, I, I think that um, if you compare Nigeria in terms of its capacity and what it has, in, uh, what it can produce as far as income, if you compare it to what they're paying out as debt and you compare it relative to other countries, um, quite honestly, you would see that Nigeria's debt is just about between 25 and 27 percent of its gross domestic product, which means Nigeria borrows just about 25 or 25 to 27 percent of what it produces. Now, um, I think that in a democracy, it is important that criticisms that are constructive are leveled against any ruling party. Because if you don't have any criticism, then you might as well forget having a democracy. However, if you look at other countries, um, uh, like uh, Pastor said, UK has 200% uh, ratio of debt to GDP. Japan has the highest in the world, 235%. United States of America has about 110% of his debt to GDP. And that's not really the issue, which is why it's very dangerous when you make these comparisons that are numbers uh, in, in economic theory. 
it's important that we look at the lives of people, look at the capacity of the country. I think Nigeria's problem is that Nigeria is not, produce, is not producing as much as it should. Because quite honestly, if, if you look at Nigeria's debt, relative to the size of the country in terms of its manpower, the resources that it has, the uh, infrastructure that it still hasn't built, Nigeria's mm -hmm. development of infrastructure is probably about 10% of what it should be, you know, um, in even close to, we're not even coming close to full capacity. So technically, Nigeria's debt to GDP is not really high. Um, indeed, we're not even close to the, break, the, the median point, which is about 63% which is the, when you pass 63%, you begin to uh, want, uh, worry about it. But it's important that as far as governance, which is what I think the vice president was alluding to, we must make sure that we're prudent because first of all, you can't develop without debt. And if you're going to develop with debt, you must make sure that that debt is used properly and that your own income, your citizens see you to be prudent. Okay. You know, perception, in a democracy is probably more than the act itself. If people perceive you to be frivolous, to be profligate, then there is a problem. Because what it means is that even the okay. people who lend you money, investors will look at you as irresponsible. Oh, oh. So these are the things that Nigeria should consider. Unfortunately, we've chosen a very expensive form of government, which is okay. the presidential system. And that is a, another not, problem altogether. Exactly. We're already getting into the cost of governance. Uh, uh, Pastor Wale, let's look at uh, some of the statements credited to the federal government through the Minister of Information within context. He has explained that this money is usually spent on infrastructure. It is more about infrastructure. They are not borrowing to pay salaries like they always allude to in the previous government. How do we take care of the infrastructural deficit, if not through borrowing? Well, I am not an economist, so, so I, I can't give this uh, an answer from an economist's perspective. Um, I, I'm, I'm talking as a layman now. Um, uh, they don't always pay salaries. They don't pay salaries on time, and that's, that's, that's an important issue, but maybe not for, for discussion today. Um, we, we need to, uh, we're spending so much money on corruption. Um, projects are costing far more than they should because we have a corrupt society. Um, and really, government should be able to take hands off um, uh, so much that they, they're involved in and just make sure that they regulate and that we have the infrastructure of power. We need to have roads, rails, and all these things. It's, it's amazing to imagine that we're transporting fuel around the country in trucks and not through pipelines, or even better still, by rail. Uh, um, so I, I think that, that um, we need to, we need to uh, uh, press government to develop infrastructure. Uh, and then we've had promises year in, year out, that we will diversify our economy. I know somebody who owns um, a, a, a large uh, plantation of cassava, and um, he has his own his own plant for processing the cassava. But he he has capacity to process far more than he actually produces. But his capacity is stunted by the fact that the roads to transport ca ca uh, cassava from other farmers are bad, and sometimes he loses a lot of his produce because of bad roads. So we, we need to, to look at these things so that we can help our, our, our people diversify. Nigeria's strength shouldn't be our oil. Nigeria's strength should be our agriculture, because that's where we had always been long before oil came along. Um, so, yeah. OK. Pastor, that's pastor, my answer. Pastor Wale, before I take the question back to the economist, let's stay with the issue of leadership, which she has raised, the issue of trust. Now, the politicians, especially the ruling party, would like to remind us that they promised Nigerians that they were going to fix one, two, three things. And as far as they are concerned, probably that's their own argument, that they need to fix these things irrespective of how it is done. It, 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 should we fix the issue of trust or we should give them benefit of doubt? Let me, let me just 
quote a few figures, and, and, and you can see why don't always trust uh, a senator in Nigeria earns uh, 1.3 million naira per month uh, in salary, and then add about 13.2 to that for allowances. So it's taking mm -hmm. home every month nearly 14 million naira. Now, the lowest paid public servant who is on minimum wage earns 30,000 naira every month, and he is taking home 0.21% of what the senator earns. Now, in, in a situation where people that are in leadership are so much better off than the people they lead, you're not going to have trust. Um, and besides, uh, people are coming out of office far wealthier than they were when they went into office. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't seem as if all the, 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 the claims that they will route out corruption are happening. And, and to a lot of people, it looks as if uh, the fight against corruption has been, become very selective. Um, so trust is a, there's a deficit of trust, without any doubt, um, uh, of, of our leaders. Okay, let me go back to Chief Loretta. Let's look at it uh, from where Pastor stopped on the issue of infrastructural uh, deficit and looking at um, what the federal government is committed to doing in terms of what they promised us. And also marry this with the layman's uh, language. Oftentimes, Nigerians, like Pastor alluded to, believe that we are not poor. The reason why we're described as poor is because of corruption. Do you also share that layman's uh, opinion, or we are indeed poor? Well, certainly there's there's some there's some truth to it. Um, there's a tremendous amount of corruption in Nigeria. Um, unfortunately, that is a perception that uh, clouds Nigeria everywhere else in the world. Now, talking if if you look at the development of infrastructure, for instance, and you look at the cost of development, the actual breakdown of what we invest monies in as far as infrastructure, you'd see that uh, it costs us more to develop uh, one kilometer of road or one kilometer of bridge with the same specifications that you would somewhere else in the world where the salaries are probably two, three times of Nigeria. That is a problem. Um, there's no question about it. However, in developing infrastructure, like I said previously, you do need to borrow. But what I believe that government should do in terms for them to be transparent is that this borrowing needs to be tied directly to the project. For instance, if you're going to lay a railroad and you're going to borrow for that railroad and government says they're going to borrow, say, $2 billion, you should tell us how much one kilometer of the railroad is going to cost us, how much the coaches will cost so that people have the opportunity to evaluate what you're doing against how it's done every, wherever else in the world. Um, that creates a level of transparency. And if you tie that money directly to the railroad, we know that when the railroad is finished and it's taken in $2 billion, the income from the railroad should be going to pay for that particular borrowing. There are, there are other options as well, which one wonders why government insists on borrowing for infrastructure, because in most parts of the world, as I said before, in a, in a different program, a lot of um, countries don't borrow anymore for infrastructure, except for infrastructure that is tied to the welfare of citizens that are in rural areas and areas where incomes are very low, where the government needs to take care of the welfare of citizens. A pastor gave uh, an example of a factory where somebody is underproducing because of, of roads. Such roads leading to farms and, and factories and so on should be concessioned to a company that does roads and have those trucks told. And the person who is doing this production can add the cost of the toll to the cost of the, the products that they're exporting. I mean, this is how it's done. So developing infrastructure is absolutely crucial for this country. We have the most important input of production, and that's human beings. I think some of the most dynamic human beings in the world, the energy of Nigerians, especially when you think of the fact that 60% of these dynamic human beings are under the age of 45. There's no reason why we shouldn't be flying side by side with other countries in the world. But 
I think that we need to get our priorities straight. And I keep saying it's not about so much money first. It's about organizing ourselves, showing clear, transparent um, planning where you're going to, how you're going to get there. Remove all the commercially viable areas out of our budget. Have them um, funded by private sector people who can afford it and who can charge for it. Airports, um, things like ports that will be run efficiently, and those companies who use their funds, not the kind of privatization, I'm not talking about the kind of concessions we okay. did in the, in the okay. electricity sector. I'm talking about getting companies that have money. Okay, uh, I, I, I sincerely believe that we'll get this network back. And that takes me to the critical issue. Now, a lot of people believe this issue about Nigeria being poor, it's a problem that has to do with our structure. And this is the popular topic here, the issue of restructuring, that as far as we have so much power to the center, so many of our industries still go straight to the center, we will remain this. Do you share that sentiment that with state, you know, controlling their resources, Nigeria will be better off? Let me take uh, Pastor Wale if the network is not uh, acting up like we have with uh, Chief Loretta. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay. Very well, very well. Nigeria was from the very inception meant to be a federation. And, and somehow when military rule came, we became a unitary system. And a, a lot of the power was reposited in the center. What has happened is that state governors are depending on a monthly allocation. So they are not generating revenue. They're not compelled to generate revenue in the way that we did prior to 1966. Um, uh, and uh, if you remember, um, my father's generation were educated uh, by public funds. They were given scholarships and so on and so forth. That's how education ran, by their various regions, as we had regions at that time. I, I think that what we have now is a huge amount of competition. Um, we have a lot of ethnicity and, and all these things. Um, I hope, can be resolved if more power is devolved. Not necessarily to the states, because many states may not be viable, but to, say, the geopolitical... Um, and you said that if you have poor leadership uh, at, the, at the state or regional level, you still will continue to have problems. So we still have to fight the fight against corruption. And as... Um, uh, Chief uh, uh, Loretta has said, um, you, you still have to uh, draw a line between what the public sector should be doing and what the private sector should be doing, especially in the area of development of infrastructure. So yes, I am very much in favor of a structure that reflects a true federation um, in which uh, regions or states or whatever the federating units are, have more control over their resources. Uh, because, you know, democracy really is about bringing government as close as possible to the people. Okay, back to you, Chief Loretta. Sometimes they describe Nigeria as being quite chocolate, so to say, where we have a big head and we have malnourished parts of the body. But have we also considered, if we have this restructuring, that some re regions are going to be super rich and some regions may just become another if not the poorest country in the world again, or poorest part of the world again? I really don't think so, because when you study the layout of Nigeria, you'll find that all every single state in Nigeria, as they exist today, can actually survive on their own. Um, I think that uh, the monies we share to the states, as Pastor alluded to, makes a lot of the states very lazy. Instead of using those funds as seed money to develop and be creative and uh, develop their different states, what is you'll find is they just lay back, collect the money, pay salaries, and nothing else is done. Um, there is, there's no state in Nigeria, quite honestly. There isn't any single one. 
If they are not by the waters, which means they can benefit from the 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 um, the um, being positioned by the water, they have minerals. If they are not by the water, which they can develop, they have uh, every part of Nigeria has arable and rock land that they can use for agriculture, benefit, improve it, add value, and export. So I don't think there's any state in Nigeria that will become impoverished under any structure. But they need to, their citizens need to get involved to make sure that the people who have the interest of the larger public are the people they elect to represent them. And I think that's really the, the fundamental problem, which also um, ties to the fact that there are a lot of people are ignorant, not educated, and don't really understand the powers they have in a democracy. If they do, I'm telling you, even as it is today, under the structure we have, a lot of these governors will sit up because their citizens will make them serve them and do what they're supposed to do for the citizens. That's a very safe way to wrap up this conversation. Thank you so much, Chief Loretta Anyogolu, an economist, and I must also say that she is also a politician. Thank you for your insight. We demand this kind of leaders in our public offices. Thank you so much. And uh, Pastor you. Wallace, since I didn't hint you that that would have been your last statement, let me just take this for 30 seconds. How do we come out of this huge cost of governance? Is it realistic to have unicameralism? Is it realistic to cut down the, 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 the size of our, our, our public service? Well, you know, I was born and alive during the parliamentary system. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with the parliamentary system. It was the operators of the parliamentary system. It was the, a lot of the intrigues that were behind, which would have wrecked a presidential system as well. The parliamentary system is a lot cheaper. And there is a lot more accountability built into the parliamentary system. Um, the prime minister must come before the house and account for all, all the actions that he takes. And so I, I believe that, that first for, for cost, we have to, to look at a much cheaper system. And then if we were able to uh, uh, devolve more power, um, we can't have governors behaving like presidents in, in, in a system like So yes, I, I think that, that um, uh, we need to, to take another look at our system of government. Also, our constitution, the 1999 constitution says we, the people. But how much input did the people of Nigeria have into Good. the production of the 99 constitution? We need to be able to sit around the table and determine um, for ourselves and not how, what has been foisted on us first by the military. Thank you so much, Pastor and Wally Adifarasi. Thank you so much for your insight. Thank you for your time, Pastor Wiley Adifarasi, Senior Pastor, Guiding Light Assembly. And our viewers, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break now. And when we return, the update on the fate of a dope state governor is up for discussion. Stay with us. <laughs>